welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. So I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, why don't you stand as we go before the Lord in prayer and in honor and reverence. And Father, we come before you today, Lord, and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. God, the Word of God even tells us, I was glad when they said, the psalmist says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Why? Because that is where your presence is. Lord, your Word tells us that when two or more are gathered together, there you are in the midst of them. And Lord, we know that we, your people, are the church, God. And when we gather together, here you are in the midst of us. And Lord, we see as evidence today for the move of the Holy Spirit, God, that you are in this place. Lord, we don't come to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for entertainment or tradition. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So, Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister to us, to plant the seed of the word of God into our hearts and into our lives, that as we leave this place, God, that we could cultivate that and water that seed of the word of God, and it would bear much fruit, Lord, as we walk out of this place, that we would be affected and, and encouraged and equipped by the word of God to go out and to do and to be full-time ministers of the gospels into the workplaces, into the schools, into our families, into our friends, and wherever we might go. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you that these blessings we don't ask just upon ourselves, but Lord, upon all the churches across the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, at no time do we see ourselves as better than anybody, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So Father, with that, we ask that you would bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Presbyterian, Episcopalian, and Methodist, and Lutheran, and Episcopalian brothers and sisters. God, we thank you that you would set your hand upon Harvest and the Grove and Sandals on, on the way. God, I ask that you bless Emmanuel Baptist on Ecclesia, on Oak Valley, Abundant Living, Crossroads. Lord, I thank you that all the churches all across the Inland Empire, Lord, too many to mention, uh, would be blessed. Father, we see ourselves as co-laborers all working together to build the kingdom of God. And Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Coachella, in Riverside, in Temecula, in San Diego, and in Coastal Hills. Lord, we thank you for our fellow rock churches. And God, we thank you that you bless them, encourage them, strengthen them, grow them, and prosper them in all the things of the word. And Lord, that they would grow and continue to affect their areas for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. And we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, And we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. If you've got your Bibles... As you're being seated, go ahead and get your Bibles out. Go with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew in the 8th chapter. We're going to look at an amazing passage of Scripture, an amazing event. Very unusual, very unlikely event, but it's in these unlikely events that God really speaks and ministers. And there's some, some great truths and some great revelation. Speaking, if, if you're new, I encourage you to grab a hold of... Uh, in the last Wednesday night's teaching, if you turn in that card for the Dr. Barron's teaching on Revelation, I'll tell you what, it's just an amazing thought, amazing. It just really spoke to me, just the word of the Lord came alive. But there's something interesting about these unusual circumstances or these unusual meeting of characters in the word of God. Tonight I want to take a, a look at one in Matthew, out of Matthew the 8th chapter. The title of tonight's message is Great Faith, Great Faith. Now, before we read about this, let's talk about this. I don't want, to, I want you to understand what we're talking about, where we're going. Great faith. Now, I'm not talking about quantitative faith. Big faith versus little bit of faith. We all have to have faith. The Bible even tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's something that if we are in this place, as a matter of fact, we can't be saved without faith because Ephesians tells us that it's by grace through faith that we come to know Christ. So it's not about a quantitative faith, and Jesus tells us that. That it's not about the size of your faith that matters. Because Jesus says the faith the size of a mustard seed could move a mountain. So we're not talking about quantitative. But what we're talking about today is I want to look at great faith. Because, you know, we can have great faith or we can have little faith. And remember, I said not quantitative, not a lot or a little. But what I am talking about is the great faith, the type of faith that you and I need to have in order to get through life. In Matthew, the 8th chapter, there's two amazing illustrations. And I'm going to paraphrase the first that actually happened later on in the, tra in the chapter and come back to the one that we're talking about, speaking of great and little faith. The first part of, or the last part of Matthew, the 8th chapter, Jesus instructs his disciples to get into the boat. Let's go across to the other side. So they get into the boat. You can look this up in Matthew. Um, yeah, Matthew, the 8th chapter. Get into the boat. Let's go to the other side. As they're in the, on the sea, 
The Bible says that a tempest arose, a storm arose, the water came in and it was overflowing the boat. And Jesus, a man of great faith, was asleep in the back on a pillow. What a sight, what an image. Here the disciples are panicking, they're worried, and they wake Jesus up and they say, Jesus, don't you care that we are dying? Jesus, if you've heard the story, if you know the story, Jesus wakes up, calms the ocean. He says to the ocean, be still. And the storm goes away. The seas remain calm. And Jesus says to his disciples, O ye of little faith. O you of little faith. Little faith. They doubted. They didn't have that faith. See, what happens is life is going to bring storms. Highs and lows. It's inescapable. We can't avoid this. We all know this. This is not, this is not anything uh, advanced or, or new to us or new revelation. Life will bring storms. And if we have little faith like the disciples, like those who followed Jesus, like those who lived with Jesus, like those who walked with Jesus, even when the storm arose, they thought, surely, even though I've got the Son of God in the boat with me sleeping, we're going to die. We can have that little faith, which will get us through. It'll get us through life. We'll find salvation. We'll find a relationship with God. Or we can look to the beginning of Matthew, the 8th chapter, and we can be people of great faith. And I don't know about you, but I want to be somebody of great faith. I want to look back at my life and I want to say that was an act of great faith. That if God would look back at me at the end of my life as I stand before the, the throne of judgment and as I recall my life and as God and I uh, review my life, that faith in my life would not be an issue of conversation. That God wouldn't look back to me and say, you could have done more. You could have believed more. You could have achieved more. But rather, that God would say to me about my faith, well done, good and faithful servant. The decision's ours. The decision is truly ours. But now I want to take a look at this unique and this interesting meeting between two people in the Bible, between Jesus and a Roman. And I want to look at some things that are said here and some things that are, 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 are written here and apply them and how we can apply them to our life to have great faith. So let's look at Matthew in the 5th chapter. Ma I'm sorry, Matthew in the 8th chapter, verse number 5. Excuse me, Matthew in the 8th chapter. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him. Verse number 6, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Now, an interesting thought here. Here's just an interesting thought. Jesus says, I will come and heal him. You see, Jesus, before we go any further, Jesus is the only one that can come and heal. Jesus is the only one that can come and deliver, that can come and provide. See, God, there, there's a statement here that Jesus is making to all that hear, that all that witness, that all that read, that Jesus says, I will come and heal. For example, let me give you this as an example. You call the church because you have a family member that's sick, much like the person of this, in this story. I need you, my, my, my father's in, 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 in the hospital. I need you to come. See, a pastor cannot say, I will come and heal him. A pastor can simply say, I will come and pray for him. Jesus is the source. And Jesus makes a very abrupt and a very, a very literal statement to this Roman. And we're going to look at this in a little bit depth, but I want to point that out to you. I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority having soldiers under me and I say to this one go and he goes and to this one another and to another come and he comes and to my servant do this and he does it so the Bible tells us this is a Roman centurion well we know that a century is a hundred so this was a captain over a hundred people he had a garrison of soldiers that he was responsible for 100 soldiers now that is nothing to be scoffed at that is nothing to you know this is a, a literal and, and a high position or a high ranking authority within the army to be to have the responsibility of a hundred soldiers underneath him and so he states I understand this that I tell somebody come they come I tell them to go they go I tell them to do this and they do that so he goes on to say when Jesus heard it he marveled and he said to those who followed 
Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Now, this is why I said this is very interesting. This is a very unique situation. Why? Because here is an outsider. Somebody that is not born into the 12 tribes of Abraham. Somebody that has not been uh, birthed into the family of God. Somebody that has not been... Get out of here, confetti. Somebody that has not been brought into the family of God. But rather, this is somebody on the outside who doesn't know what we know. Yet, Jesus says... Besides all of that, I haven't found faith like this man in all of Israel. He's making a clear statement here. And he's saying, you guys should know this. You should be people of great faith. Why? Because you've seen God. You've seen the prophecies. You've seen the power of God. And yet, here this outsider who knows nothing comes and says, Lord, I know you can do it. All you've got to do is say it. And Jesus marveled. Remember, I said, I want to be a person of great faith. I want to challenge you to look at your life and say, I want to be a person of great faith too. To the point where God looks at us and marvels and say, wow, beyond the circumstances, they rose above the expectations. Beyond the trials of life, they went over and above what everybody else thought they could do. I want to have great faith. Nay, I want to have marvelous faith. Because Jesus marveled. And he said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse number 13 goes on to say, Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. What an amazing story. Here this outsider comes to Jesus and says, my servant is tormented and all I need you to do is speak. And Jesus says, as you believe, it's done. Go your way. And as he was departed, as he left, his servant was healed. What an amazing statement. And I want to look at this idea of great faith. I want to look at this idea of of, of faith that, that makes God himself marvel and how we can apply this to our lives. To look at this story, to look at this situation and say, what can we learn from this and what can we do and apply to our own lives, to our own walks, so that we can get over the shortcomings of life and be people of great faith. That we could accomplish more than we've ever dreamed of. That we could achieve more than our families ever thought that we could attain more than we ever thought we were capable of doing because that is God's intent for you, church. Listen, God's design for you is to be people of marvelous faith. You may have grown up where your parents or your teachers or those around you said you'll never achieve or you'll never amount to anything, but God's intent for you is that you would far exceed the expectations of those around you Now, those that your family, those who spoke into your life, even those who said, listen, you're going to do great and mighty things. How about that? That you would far exceed what they even thought. Because it is God's intent for us to be a people of great faith. So that when life storms happen, like the disciples that follow Jesus, when the wind and the waves come into the boat and they begin to drown the boat out, that we won't have to go to Jesus as he sleeps on the pillow and say, Lord, don't you care? But rather we could say, well, you know what? If it's good enough for Jesus to sleep, I'm going to pull out my little pillow right now and I'm going to rest too because obviously God is in my boat. So we got to be people of great faith. So today we're going to look at some things. Listen, let me just share this with you. You may not have known this. Did you know that the gospel is simple? It's incredibly complex, yes. We have volumes written about that to study in the Greek and the Hebrew and all the different meetings and sub-meetings and stories and how everything... But did you know that at the root of it, it's very simple? Oftentimes we say, man, I just don't understand it. I can't get it. I, I just can't. I, you, pull out, you pull out these big monster dictionaries and they, I just can't understand it. Did you know it's simple? It's very simple. And today, I want to keep with that thought. It's simple. Great faith is not difficult. Great faith is not hard. Great faith is not hard to comprehend. It's not beyond your understanding. 
it's very simple. And sometimes it's those simple things that we got to kind of slap ourselves and say, wow, that was so simple I overlooked it. So today I want to look at three very simple things from the Roman centurion in Jesus' conversation about great faith so that we can walk out of this place equipped. You see, you don't come into this place just to get word into you. You know that? You don't come to church so that you can just get it in and store it in. You're not, you're not a savings account. All right? You're not trying to get it and hoard it. You're a checking account. You know what that means? It means it comes in and then you spend it. So you come to church to get equipped. What that means is the word of God speaks to you. Say, oh, hallelujah, praise God. I got so much out of that. Great. Now take it outside of the four walls of this building and apply it. That is where it matters. So it's very simple today. I just want to look at some things from the Roman centurion Jesus conversation and their interaction with each other about great faith. Looking at a person of great faith. So I'm going to say the statement, a person of great faith, and then I'm going to complete that sentence. So it's all basically just one sentence. Number one for tonight, a person of great faith isn't wrapped up in themselves. A person of great faith isn't wrapped up in themselves. Now, I'm not even talking about conceit. I'm not even talking about, oh, wow, I think I got all my ducks in a row and I'm all that, I'm in a bag of chips. I'm not even going there about conceit. I'm just talking about you're not wrapped up in your own life. You're not wrapped up in your own motives. You're not wrapped up in everything about you. Looking at this centurion, a person of great faith isn't wrapped up in themselves. Look what it says again. I'll take you back to Matthew in the 8th chapter, verse number 5. Jesus entered Capernaum. A centurion came to him. We've talked about this. A centurion means that he's the leader over 100 people. He's high up in the chain of command when it comes to the soldiers. He's not just your infantry. He came with him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said, I'll come to him. Verse number, uh, verse number 8 says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Going back now to verse number 5, a centurion came to Jesus and pleaded with Jesus. A Roman, an occupier, a captor came to a Jew. Let's just be real here. Let's be honest. A Roman came to somebody who they are occupying their land and pleaded. Didn't demand, didn't boss him, didn't say, hey, listen, I'm a centurion. I've got a lot of power. I can lock you up. I can throw you. I can waste your time. I can spend your time in litigation. I can do all. I can do all. He, didn't, he came and pleaded with him. Which means that here's a man of authority that came and recognized something about Jesus Christ. Now it goes on to say, Jesus, we talked about this, said, I will come and heal him. Jesus recognizes the plea for this centurion. But look what he goes on to say. My servant, verse number five, Jesus says, I will come in here. My servant, here is a Roman soldier concerned for the well-being of his servant. Think about this for a moment. This is a day and age of slavery. This is a day and age when, when if you went into debt and you couldn't pay your debt, you became a slave, a labor slave. And here's this man, that this society that places little value on on human life. As a matter of fact, the church history tells us that one governor said about Christians that I'll have them crucified because they're so stubborn that they're either guilty or because of their stubbornness divert, desert, deserve to die. That's the, that's the value of life that they had. So here's a Roman soldier that was trained in this, that was brought up in this, and that says, my servant is sick. To the point he makes a plea to Jesus Christ. He didn't have to care. You see, many people came and said, Lord, my son is sick. Lord, my daughter is sick. Lord, my mother is sick. But here's this man of authority that says, my servant is sick. He's not wrapped up in his position. He's not wrapped up saying, well, yeah, he's a servant. When he dies, I'll get rid of him or I'll get another one or they'll send me another person when they die. It's, he has a value on life. He's not wrapped up in his position. He's not wrapped up in his title. He's not wrapped up in his self. And Jesus says, I'll come to him. And then he goes on to say, no, I'm not worthy that you should enter my house. He says, I'm not worthy that you should enter my house. Think about this for a moment. Here's a man of authority. Here's a man that walks around town with his head held high. You know, he doesn't look up to anybody in his town. He looks down on everybody in his town because he is of the occupying force. He is the symbol of Rome to the people around him. And here he says, I'm not worthy that you should even come to my house. Just say the word and I know my servant will be healed. He wasn't wrapped up in his position. 
He wasn't wrapped up in his title. He wasn't wrapped up in his ability. He wasn't wrapped up in the fact that he could afford physicians. And likely he had already brought physicians to his servant and they couldn't do anything about it. But he realized now that his servant was in a place that no physician could do anything for. And the only situation or the only solution was to go to somebody who was able to do something about it. And he heard about this man named Jesus and he beckoned him, please do something for my servant. He pleaded with him. A man of authority, a man of position, a man of stature. But let's look at some things here. Let's look at some thoughts about this centurion being wrapped up in his position and Jesus' response. Number one, he was a soldier. Now, in this day and age, soldiers, piety was not very common amongst soldiers, which means that they were not very religious people. Soldiers oftentimes were, were brutal. They had seen the, the horrors of life. These were the ones that were, that were responsible for crucifixions and imprisonments and arrests and, and all sorts of different heinous and horrible things that they had to do. So piety was not a part or a common part of their life. So here's a strike against this man in his position. He was a soldier. Secondly, or number two, he was a Roman. This means that to every Jew in the city that he was a symbol of the occupying force that came in and took the land from the Jews. They hated Rome. To the point, Rome let the Jews worship and do the things that the Jews wanted to do because they were so fierce in their resistance to Rome that Rome said, let them just do their thing. They hated Romans. Strike two. Number three, this man was a Gentile, meaning a non-Jew. He wasn't of the tribe or the 12 tribes of Abraham. He, he wasn't born in the, in, 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 the, in the promised land, you know, and, and didn't grow up reading the Torah and memorizing the word of God. He was an outcast, an outsider. Three strikes against him. And Jesus says, I will come. I will come. Do you know what that says to you and I? That says to you and I, it doesn't matter where you come from. That says to you and I, it doesn't matter how wealthy or how poor you are. That says to you and I, it doesn't matter where your past has brought you or what your position is now, that God wants you to come to him open-hearted and say, I need you. And when you do, when we become this person that relieves ourselves of our own selfish ambitions or our own thoughts about ourselves, when we stop looking out for number one, God says, I will come and I will heal you. I will come and I will heal you. I will come and I will provide. I will come and I will bless but it took somebody, it took somebody from the outside saying, Lord, come, my servant is in need, and I know you can do this. We've got to not be so worried about our own image, not so wrapped up in ourselves to be a person of great faith. You see, the more humility that you and I have, the greater faith we live. Because we don't rely on ourselves. We don't rely on our strength. We don't rely on our power. We don't rely on our own will to get through things. But rather now, because of humility, we say, like Chris's prayer today during worship, God, I must decrease so that you in my life can increase. And when you in my life increase, then my faith grows to the point where I am a person of great faith. Now, let me give you something very interesting. Let me give you something very interesting. Two times in the New Testament it records that Jesus encourages somebody or commends somebody because of their faith. Two times Jesus tells somebody these two words, great faith. I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. And, O oh woman, great is your faith. Did you know the two times Jesus commends people in the New Testament that are recorded for us, that he commends people for, for great faith? Did you know that both times they were Gentiles? You're not getting it. Listen, listen. Talking about getting wrapped up in yourselves. Here's the Jews. Here's the people that read the word of God. Here's the people that had read the stories, that had been taught the stories from the moment they were born, they heard about the greatness and goodness of God. Here's the people that grew up with an image knowing that they are the chosen ones. They had an identity. And what had happened is they had gotten so wrapped up in their identity that Jesus said, oftentimes, how long will I deal with you, you faithless generation? 
O you of little faith, like he said to his Jewish disciples. But then these two Gentiles come, and he says to them, I have not seen such great faith for, in all of Israel. Could it be that God is saying to us, get off yourself, get off the title of Christian, get off what society says, get off the look, get away from all of this and that and focus on what really needs to be focused on, your relationship with God, so that you can move beyond yourself and be a person of great faith. Interesting that Jesus speaks to the Gentiles of great faith, but the Jews are of little faith. In 2 Kings in the 5th chapter, if you've got your Bibles, keep your Bibles in Matthew the 8th chapter. In 2 Kings, go with me to, let's look at a very similar story. Very, very similar story. 2 Kings, the 5th chapter, you guys with me tonight? You're quiet in this Presbyterian church. 2 Kings in the 5th chapter. A man by the name of Naaman is sick. Now, interesting, Jesus isn't, isn't on earth at this time. But there's a prophet. The prophet is the representation of God. Naaman, much like the Roman centurion, is a leader of many soldiers. Naaman is a military leader. Naaman is sick. Naaman pleads for his health. And Elisha, he goes to the prophet, to Elisha. Verse number Eight. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent the king, saying, Where have you, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him, Naaman, come to me, and I will show him that there is a God, that there is a prophet in Israel. Verse number 9. Then Naaman went with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. Remember, the Romans in turn said, I'm not worthy, Jesus, that you even come to my house. Naaman goes to Elijah's house and stands at his door. So it's like the Roman centurion saying, Jesus, I'm going to knock on your door because my servant needs to be healed. Stood at the door of Elisha, and Elijah sent a messenger saying to him, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Look what this says in verse number 11. But Naaman became furious and went away and said to himself, Indeed, I said to myself, I will surely come out he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. So Naaman says, listen, here's how I imagined it going like this. I'm going to show up on Elijah's door. He's going to come out and he's going to make this big old grand scene in the name of the Lord. Make this big old scene. So when Elisha sends his servant and says, Elisha says, go, go wash in the river seven times, you'll be healed. Naaman is furious. I'm a soldier. I'm a man of stature. I'm a man of position. I deserve Elisha to come and speak to me. He's furious and he leaves. Verse number 12. Are not the Abana and the Farfar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, master, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then? How much more then? How, if the prophet would have told you to give everything that you owned for your healing, wouldn't you have done it? If he would have done something that was go climb to the top of this mountain and carry a hundred pound rock to the very top to show your dedication, wouldn't you have done that? How much more than if he says to go wash and be clean, should you go wash in the river and be clean? Sometimes in life, we expect God to show up in great and grandiose ways. Sometimes we expect God to speak to us with the heavens open up and the earthquake and the rocks and the fire. And God says to us small and still things and, and subtle and, and little changes in life. And we say, no! It's because we're so wrapped up in our image. And well, God, I deserve this. I've worked so hard. God, I've done this and I've done that and I've done this. And I deserve for you to listen to me. And we get so wrapped up in our image that we lose hold of the faith of God. We can't get wrapped up in that, guys. We can't get wrapped up. Don't get so wrapped in your ability or your image. You know why? Because you can't do anything. 
Jesus says in John the 15th chapter, without me you can do nothing. So the more humility we live in our lives, the greater our faith. The more humility, the greater our faith. All right, I'm moving on because you're staring at me like an account in a gate. Number two, a person of great faith. Number two, a person of great faith is a person who understands authority. A person who understands authority. Matthew, remember I had you stay there or put a thumb there or a ribbon there. Matthew in the eighth chapter, verse number eight, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word. Just say it and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and say to this one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and my servant, do this, and he does it. There's an amazing statement here that we often pass over, because the soldier gives us his resume. I can speak and somebody does it, but did you see what he said before he said that? Did anybody catch what he said before he says, I can tell somebody to do something and they'll do it? Did, you, did anybody catch what he said? He said, I am a man, what? Under authority. You know what that means? Do you know what that means? That means he recognizes that he's not the commander-in-chief. He recognizes that, yes, he can dictate orders and they'll be followed, but when somebody above him dictates orders to him, that he also, like the people below him, must follow those orders. And so he understands authority. And so he comes to Jesus not just saying, I'm a person that if I speak, it gets done. I'm a person that I've seen people speak, and i got to get out there and do it. He understands authority. Not only are we over more than conquerors like the Bible says, but listen, guys, we are under authority. We have got to understand and recognize authority in our lives to be people of great faith. Are you with me tonight? Do you know what authority means? Let me just give me a different word for authority. Authority equals obedience. Authority equals obedience. Why? Because if somebody says something with authority, you do it. Because their authority dictates or demonstrates, your obedience demonstrates that authority. So this man is saying, listen, I understand that when you say something, there are powers and principalities and things in this life and in this world that are obedient or that must be obedient to you. Much like I am obedient to my superiors and my uh, uh, subordinates are obedient to me. I have a full, well understanding of authority. But here's the thought. To be people of great faith. We've got to understand the comprehensive, the big picture of authority, guys. You know, we, we look at life and we say, you know what? I get it. The Word of God is greater than anything. The Word of God, the, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. I believe that Jesus can heal me. I know that the name of Jesus is greater than cancer. I know that, that God is, is greater than my situation. And we believe in the authority of that area. But yet, if we believe that there is authority over our problems... We need to understand that there is authority over our entire lives. And what happens, listen, let's just be honest, we've all been there. What happens is we want to give God the authority over our issues, but when God says, all right, authority is authority. If you want to be under the authority of God, you want him to have authority over your issues or your faith or whatever it is that you need, blessings, healings, whatever it might be, then you also need to understand that you are placing yourself under the authority of God. That means that the things that are not pertaining to your faith, but rather to the walk of life, you need to give God authority of. You want God to show up in your life, but you don't do anything in your relationship about it because God has authority over here, but none over here. And then we wonder why we are people of little faith. Because we don't have a comprehensive idea of authority. You come to church. I come to church and expect God to intervene, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, when God says do this or do that, I say, God, it's not important enough. Why? Because I don't give him the authority in my life. How then can we be people of great faith? Listen to me. How then can we be people of great faith if we don't hand the authority of God over to our entire lives? To our entire lives. The worst thing we could do in our lives, oh, church, if you get anything, get this. The worst thing that we can do in our lives is to diminish the authority of Jesus Christ. The worst thing you can do in your life is diminish the authority of Jesus. How do I diminish the authority of Jesus Christ in my life? What you treat as common will become common. Have you ever noticed that when President Barack Obama, George Bush, Bill Clinton, George Bush before, Ronald Reagan from ages, 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 ages. Did you ever notice that when they address the nation, they wear a suit and a tie? 
Do you ever notice that the presidents don't dye their hair? You know why? Because it's a position of authority. And if they get on TV with a t-shirt and shorts, oh, I'm on vacation, I got a Hawaiian shirt on today, it's casual Friday. <laughs> they diminish the, the position of authority. And soon after a while, what you treat as common will become common, and that non-common, or that highly coveted and highly respected position will become a position of common, and a position of, 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 of tradition. The worst thing we could do in our life is bring the authority of God down to our level. I remember there was this movie. Oh, guy. There's this movie. It's always on TV. And they were, they were talking around the dinner table, and this guy was praying. And he started to describe how Jesus looked to him. And another person described how Jesus looked to him. Oh, I'm, well, I, I see Jesus like this, and I see Je I have never been able to make it past that part of the movie. Here's why. Because when you make Jesus your homeboy, when you see Jesus as little baby Jesus in the manger, you know what you're doing? Do you know what you, do you understand? You might laugh at it. You think, oh, I know what movie you're talking about. But do you understand what you're doing? You are diminishing the authority of Jesus Christ and bringing it down to a place of common. And how can you expect great results from something that you have made common in your life? Oh, church, we have got to be a people that understands authority, that has, respects and fears God. Yes, God is loving, but God is not this gray hair, gray bearded grandfather in the sky that wants to give us hugs and kisses all day long. God is a God to be respected, to be feared. God is a God to be held on a pedestal. God is a God to be held above all things and to never, never, never be brought down to a position of commonplace. Oh, gosh. My heart is so heavy about that because in America, in the modern-day churches, we have lost the respect and the reverence of Jesus Christ. And then we wonder, where is God in our lives? Start treating God like he's something of value to you and see where your faith grows. I have gone so far too long and I know that you want me to be done. So number three tonight, a person of great faith, number three, has great belief in Jesus Christ. A person of great faith has great belief in Jesus Christ. Great belief. Great belief. A person of great faith has great belief. A confident expectation saying, I know that something is going to happen. A person of great faith has great... Listen, the Roman centurion didn't go to a witch doctor. The Roman centurion didn't seek out some well-known healer. He went to Jesus. Why? Because he had a faith and a belief that said, this man will heal me. Or my servant, the woman with the issue of blood, said, I have a great belief, and if I could just touch his garment, the, 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 the Canaanite woman or the Gentile, the, the woman's daughter said, if I could just have the crumbs that fall from the table, the leftover scraps, it's more than enough that I need. Why? Because I have a great belief in Jesus Christ. Verse number 8, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse number 10 says, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, those who follow, surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even Israel. And I will say to you that many will come from the east and the west from all over the place. It will not just be this place. And sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God, meaning it is not just for the Jews. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. Those who were once in by title will no longer be in by title, but now will be in because of their faith. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed. Let it be done to you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Jesus marveled at this man because of his belief. Sometimes we have to slap ourselves in our beliefs. Sometimes we have got to slap our own selves and say, listen, I'm not going to go there. I believe that Jesus can do this. Well, listen, when you get sick, your first resource, the first thing you do should not be going on WebMD. The first thing that happens when you, you feel that sore throat coming on or your kids or your job, or the economy, is to not say, what does the news say? The first thing you should do is go to that who you believe. I'm, feeling not, I'm not feeling good. Well, you know what? WebMD says I'm going to die no matter what because i got a sore throat. I must have throat cancer. <laughs> no, but rather go to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. <laughs> Slap yourself. 
Say, no, I'm going to believe in Jesus Christ. Mark 11, chapter, I'll just put it up on the overhead, verse number 22. Jesus said, after withering a fig tree, fig tree just by simply speaking to it, they said, how can we do this? Jesus said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Do you know what Jesus did? Jesus just laid out for you and for me the formula, the recipe on the box that says you want to have good faith? Here it is. Here it is. Ask, believe, you will receive. That's it. To, in order to have great faith, you have to have great belief in Jesus Christ. It's not about size. It's the faith of a mustard seed will move the mountain. But rather, it's not the mustard seed. Why? Because it's not the mustard seed moving the mountain. It's your faith in Jesus Christ that moves it. So where is your faith? Where is your faith? Where is your faith tonight? Slap yourself if you've got to get out of faith. You know why? Because, because doubt is the antidote to your faith. You want to kill your faith? Start doubting. You'll kill it fast. But a person of great faith has a great belief in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he told his servant, go. For what you believe, as you have believed, it's done. As you have believed, let it be to you. As you believe, let it be to you. Church, people of great faith, as you believe, let it be to you. You want to be successful as, it, as you believe? Let it be to you. You want to have a, a healthy family? As you believe, let it be to you. You want to be healthy all the days of your life? As you believe, let it be to you. You want to get over the situation in life? As you believe, let it be to you. Shake yourselves and say, listen, I will put my faith in Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of my life. Today, talking about person of great faith, the biggest faith to our hindrance is not the devil. Yes, he will try. The biggest hindrance to your faith is you. The biggest hindrance to your faith is you. Un unbelief and doubt. Don't kill your faith before you even get it off the ground by doubt. Believe in Jesus Christ. He can do it. And because of your belief in Jesus Christ, you can get through it. Let us be a people of great faith. Let us be a people of reflection of Jesus Christ living in us. Not wrapped up in ourselves. Not diminishing the authority or making it commonplace, but understanding the authority of Jesus Christ. And not doubting what we believe, but rather believing what we believe. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Hey, listen. Ushers are still doing their thing. I was thinking, man, there's still more, but that, our 25th anniversary is over. I was waiting for that video. Hey, listen, let the ushers finish doing what they're doing. Please don't get up. Please don't walk out. A lot of you guys already have. And I just want to ask you, just come on, respect the Lord. Respect what's going on in this place. Give me a moment more of your time. Listen up. I want to ask you a question, just really quickly. I just want to ask you this. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? You know, it's a really simple question. And each one of us will have an answer in our own hearts and in our own lives. So and nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. But let's examine those answers tonight. You know, you might say, I'm going to get to heaven, but let me ask you this question. What makes you think you're going to get there? What makes you so sure you're going to get to heaven? You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope I'm going to get to heaven. I really want to go to heaven. Hey, listen, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think that you're going to get to heaven or hope that you're going to get to heaven or want to go there? And because of those things that you're going to get there, nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can think, hope, or want your way into heaven. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luca, my parents told me that I was a Christian. I went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. I was baptized. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can get into heaven because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you've given yourself the title of Christian, because you've called yourself a Christian all your life, because you've got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents took you to church on Christmas and on Easter or baptized, baptized you as a baby or christened you as a baby. Are you going to get to heaven? You see, you can't get to heaven that way. You know, you might say, well, Pastor, look, I'm a good person. I don't do bad things. I've done more good in my life than bad. I give to charitable organizations. You know, I mean, doesn't that, doesn't that account for something? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a good person, you're going to get to heaven? But wait, so many people believe that all I've got to do is be good 
and we'll get to heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. As a matter of fact, God tells us that His righteousness, our goodness according to His righteousness, is like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get to heaven. Oh, listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough. You need someone to tell you the truth. You can't get to heaven because you're a good person. Not going to get to heaven because you're a good person. Pastor Luke, I wasn't raised in any other religion. Doesn't that mean that by default or by classification I'm going to get to heaven? No, in the Bible does it say that there's a, a, a classification system that if you weren't a, a Buddhist, Hindu, or Muslim or anything else, that means that by default you're going to get to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You're not going to find it because it's not there. You can't get to heaven that way. Well, but Pastor Luke, I served in the children's ministry, the youth ministry. I, I know a couple verses in the Bible. I, I sang in the choir. I have a card in my wallet that says I'm a member of a church. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a leader in your church, because you served in the children or youth usher's ministry, because you sang in the choir, because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you memorized John 3.16 or some other verses, that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. You can't get to heaven that way. You know why? Because it's God's heaven. The only way to get there is God's way. And Jesus, in a conversation in the book of John in the third chapter, in a conversation with a man by the name of Nicodemus, was a religious leader of his day, Nicodemus, memorized the scripture. Nicodemus gave to the poor, did all the right things, said all the good things in his life, wore the right clothes. Jesus, you would have thought when they were talking about getting into heaven that Jesus would have pat Nicodemus on the back and said, man, you just keep on going. You're doing a great job. But Nic Jesus says to Nicodemus this. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does that mean? You think, oh, crazy, weirdo, out of control, Christianity. But let me tell you something. I don't care what Hollywood, I don't care what popular culture, I don't care what society me says about it. The only way you and I get to heaven is God's way, and that is to be born again. And from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. Here's what it means, that you've given God all your heart, you've given God all your life. That's it. It's that simple. Remember, I told you this was easy. You've given God all your heart, you've given all your life. You don't get to heaven because you know who God is. You know, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. You don't get to heaven because you've memorized scripture. The Bible tells us that the devil himself, when he tempted Jesus, quoted scripture to him. He are not going to get to heaven because you've memorized the scripture. Why? Because God is not after your mental ascent towards him. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. People like you and I sitting in church, doing good things, hearing the word of God. He says, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. He says, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. Shocking, rude, crude statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what he is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define it for you in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Lukewarm means this. It means that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, you're kind of floating around, ping-ponging back and forth, in and out of church, in and out of your relationship with God. You're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. You're kind of riding the fence, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing, right down the middle. And Jesus Christ says, if you're living lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. And you will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. You see, you see, you can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way. It's God's heaven. The only way we can get there is God's way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it any other way but God's way tonight. And I want to give you that opportunity. And in just a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, in just a few moments, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. And on the count of three, I'm going to go bang! And smack my hand on the Bible just like that real loud. And I want to give you the opportunity to give Jesus Christ all your heart. Give him all your life. And what I want you to do in just a moment is when I count to three, if that's you in this place, when I smack my hand on the Bible, bang! Just like that. In just a moment, I want to ask you to be bold and pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give him all my heart. I want to give Jesus Christ all my life. I want to go to heaven. I want to leave hell behind, and I want to make sure today that I get into heaven. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, I can't raise my hand. I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? You might be embarrassed. That's true. But let me encourage you to get over it. Why? Because Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in or make his way in. You say, Pastor Luke, that's great. I appreciate that. You find God your way. I'll find God my way. We'll all get there the same. All roads lead to heaven. Let me tell you something. All roads don't lead to heaven. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. The only way you and I can get there is God's way. And I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth, to not beat around the bush and to not play games, but to tell you like it is right out of the word of God 
that you've got to give him all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. There's no other way. So the decision's yours today. Who should raise their hand? If you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life today, just a moment, if that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure, maybe you did this as a kid, you know, but you never followed through with it. You did it, I see the hand, I see, the, I see those two hands. We'll do it all together, but I got you, girls. You did this as a kid, never really followed through it. Maybe a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusade. If that's you in just a moment, I want you to get your hand up. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying, hey, you've been running from God instead of to God today, let's make this the day that you go forward in your relationship with God. Ensure your place in heaven, denying hell for eternity. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't believe in hell. I don't care if you believe in hell or not. Whether you see it or believe it is different. It's a, it exists whether you believe it or not. It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. You're going to stand on the slow lane of the freeway and meet one face to face. Hell is a real place. Heaven is a real place. We're destined for heaven. It wasn't created, hell wasn't created for us, but it's your decision. You got to give them all your heart. You got to give them all your life. Finally, if you've been running from God instead of to God in just a moment, if that's you, get ready. Hands are already going up in this place. If that's you, don't let this moment pass you by. Today is the day of your salvation. Here we go. I'm going to count. If that's you, get ready. Whether wherever you're at, from the front to the back, boy, or if you're watching my camera or online watching, if that's you, just get your hand up, pop your hand up in just a moment. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down and we'll move forward in your relationship with God. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, get ready. This is your day. Today is the day of your salvation. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. I saw those two, three, four. I see you. Five, I see you. Is there a hand over there? No, that's not a hand. You're scratching your head. You scratch your head. I'm going to count you. Six, I see you. Six wise people. I see you, my friend. Six wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Six wise people. Seven, I see you. Eight, I see you. Eight wise people in this place today. Anybody else in this place say, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. In the family rooms, is there anybody in the family rooms? In the back, in the front, wherever you're at, come on, if that's you in this place today. Anybody else in this place today? Eight wise people say, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. If that's you in this place, come on, where are you at? If, you, if there's eight, you know there's ten. Where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number ten? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, you should. You're saying, I wonder if this guy would ever shut up. Maybe if you got your hand up, we'll move forward if that's you in this place today. Come on, quit playing games with God to make today the best day of your life. Make today the rest of your life. Anybody else in this place? Eight wise people. Anybody else? I don't want to miss this, and I don't want you to miss your opportunity. Anybody else today? I'm going to close this up right now. Anybody else? Well, praise God for eight wise people. Hallelujah. Well, hey, listen, for the eight of you that raised your hand from the front to the back, wherever you're at, listen, you said you want to give them all your heart. You said you want to give them all your life. You don't do that by, get, by raising your hand. You say, I acknowledge. I, I want to get saved, Pastor Luke, is what you said. I told you that. You could say by asking him to be the Lord and Savior, inviting him in to be your Lord and Savior of your life. And we want to help you with that. You said you were going to do this. We want to help you. If you're serious about this, here's what I'm going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and sing a song together. If you came with somebody, I want you to grab your friend, your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, whatever you did, whoever you came with, that's all right. Grab somebody, grab the person you came with and get out of your seat as we all stand and get out of your seat, get into the aisles and come and meet me at this altar and let's change destinies together. If that's you, if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on, be bold. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair and come and meet me at this altar. Let's change destinies destinies together. That's you. Come on. You can come. Come on. From the front to the back, wherever you're at. Come on. If that's you, come on. Jesus, I belong to you. Come on. If that's you, please nobody leave. If that's you, come on. You can come. Come on. Jesus, I believe. Come away, come on. Well, hey, listen. I see three. There were eight. If you raise your hand, listen, guys, you don't get saved. I see you guys. We'll wait for you. That's five. If you raised your hand, listen, you need to understand. You need to have somebody that loves you enough to tell you the truth. You don't get saved because you popped your hand up in a church. You get saved because you give them all your heart. You give them all your life. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Let's get serious about God today. Come on, we'll wait for you. Praise God. There we are. All right. Good for you guys. Hey, listen, I want to do something. I want to enter. Oh, come on. We'll wait for you. You coming down? We'll wait for you. Come on.
Praise God. Hey, listen, as you make your way down, I want to talk to you guys for just a moment. I want to introduce something. I'm going to introduce a friend of mine to you. This guy right over here waving at you, this is Pastor Joel. Like Noel for Christmas, Joel, all right? Really cool guy. Pastor Joel is going to do a couple things. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on, I promise. I'm as weird as it gets. You, you survived me. You made it through it, all right? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Secondly, he's going to give you some free literature, some things to help you get strong in your walk with God. And the third thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. Somebody that will come alongside of you, meet, you, meet with you before service, teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong for a couple of weeks. They're called spiritual personal trainers. Like you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, a Christian personal trainer. I promise they're not going to make you do any physical work. They're going to make you do some heart and spiritual work, and that's, that's something that they'll do. But they're going to get you strong so you don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just go to your left, my right, right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.